The church bell has rung. It's 10 o'clock in the morning at Grace Church on the Hill, and we welcome everyone to our Palm Sunday worship. It's a beautiful spring morning. The daffodils are blooming on the south wall of our church. Spring is here, but everything else is abnormal. Normally, we would be gathering in a great Eucharistic community and afterwards at a wonderful parish brunch. But today, we are dispersed in the body of Christ, self-isolated. So we want to reach out to you and you to us as we worship the Lord in spirit and in truth, the beginning of this holy week. As I said last year, we, last week, we come before God with clean hands with clean hands and a pure heart. Well, at the start of this Holy Week, it's a great joy to welcome our area bishop, Bishop Kevin Robertson, to Grace Church. He's here in the flesh. He's not here virtually. He's actually here. And we rejoice also that my friend and colleague, our lay pastoral assistant, Maria Ling, has emerged from the cocoon and chrysalis that she's been in for the last two weeks of quarantine, and a beautiful butterfly has emerged. And uh, Maria, this is such a joy to have you participating once again in the worship here at Grace Church, live in the flesh. I would be remiss if I did not thank our organist, Tom Fitches, who has been so faithful in providing live music to our community each Sunday. Also to Sarah, our music director, and our administrator, Chris Leonard. His ingenuity in bringing this live streaming, uh, we are so grateful for your work, Chris. But it is Palm Sunday, and it's the start of our solemn Holy Week, uh, the richest week of the Christian calendar. And with God's help, we will, as the people of God, enter into this week, the story of this week, and follow it and participate in it spiritually. So it may be a renewing and transforming experience once again for us Christians, even though everything in the world is uncertain and dark. But we thank God for God's goodness and grace today. Hosanna to the son of David, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna to the Son of David. Dear friends in Christ, during Lent, we have been preparing for the celebration of our Lord's Paschal mystery. On this day, our Lord Jesus Christ entered the holy city of Jerusalem in triumph. The people welcomed him with palms and shouts of praise, but the path before him led to darkness, suffering, self-giving, and death. But today we greet him as our Lord and King, although we know his crown is thorns and his throne a cross. We follow him through this week from the glory of the palms to the glory of the resurrection by the way of the dark road of suffering and death. United with him in his suffering on the cross, may we share finally in his resurrection and the newness of those mighty acts whereby you give us life and immortality through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And let us hear the Palm Sunday Gospel Narrative. A reading from Matthew. When they had come near Jerusalem and had reached Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go into the village ahead of you and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, just say this, the Lord needs them, and he will send them immediately. This took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Look, 
Your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put their cloaks on them, and he sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and that followed were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest heaven! When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil, asking, Who, who is this? The crowds were saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us sing, Ride on, Ride on with Majesty. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, who in tender love for all our human race sent your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, to take our flesh and suffer death upon a cruel cross. May we follow the example of his great humility and share in the glory of his resurrection through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Now let us hear the readings of this Passion Sunday. A reading from Paul's letter to the Philippians. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness. And being found in human form, 
he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. The Word of the Lord. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am in distress. My eye wastes away from grief, my soul and body also. For my life is spent with sorrow, my years with sighing. My strength fails because of my misery, and my bones waste away. I am the scorn of all my adversaries, a horror to my neighbors, an object of dread to my acquaintances. Those who see me in the street flee from me. I have passed out of mind like one who is dead. I have become like a broken vessel, for I hear the whispering of many, terror all around. As they scheme together against me, as they plot to take my life. But I trust in you, O Lord, I say you are my God. My times are in your hand. Deliver me from the hand of my enemies and persecutors. Let your face shine upon your servant. Save me in your steadfast love. Let us stand for the reading of the Passion Gospel. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, You say so. But when he was accused by the chief priests and elders, he did not answer. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many accusations they make against you? But he gave him no answer, not even to a single charge, so that the governor was greatly amazed. Now at the festival, the governor was accustomed to release a prisoner for the crowd anyone whom they wanted. At that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Jesus Barabbas. So after they had gathered, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release for you? Jesus Barabbas or Jesus who is called the Messiah? For he realized that it was out of jealousy that they had handed him over. While he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife said word to him, Have nothing to do with that innocent man, for today I have suffered a great deal because of a dream about him. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowds to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus killed. The governor again said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, Then what should I do with Jesus, who is called the Messiah? All of them said, Let him be crucified. Then he asked, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Let him be crucified. So when Pilate saw that he could do nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took some water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. Then the people as a whole answered, His blood be on us and on our children. So he released Barabbas for them, and after flogging Jesus, he handed him over to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters 
and they gathered the whole cohort around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. And after twisting some thorns into a crown, they put it on his head. They put a reed in his right hand and knelt before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! They spat on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. After mocking him, they stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. As they went out, they came upon a man from Cyrene named Simon. They compelled this man to carry his cross. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull, they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall. But when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided his clothes among themselves by casting lots. Then they sat down there and watched over him. Over his head they put the charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then two bandits were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by derided him, shaking their heads and saying, You who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests also, along with the scribes and elders, were mocking him, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the King of Israel. Let him come down from the cross now, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now, if he wants to. For he said, I am God's son. The bandits who were crucified with him also taunted him in the same way. From noon on, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And about three o'clock, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, This man is calling for Elijah. At once, one of them ran and got a sponge, filled it with sour wine, put it on a stick and gave it to him to drink. But the others said, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. Then Jesus cried again with a loud voice and breathed his last. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs also were opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. After his resurrection, they came out of the tombs and entered the holy city and appeared to many. Now when the centurion and those with him who were keeping watch over Jesus saw the earthquake and what took place, they were terrified and said, Truly, this man was God's son. The Gospel of Christ. Before we hear Bishop Kevin's address this morning, we're going to take a moment of reflection. Our organist, Tom Fitches, will play a chorale prelude by Johann Sebastian Bach. Have mercy upon us, Lord. Have mercy upon us.
May the words of my lips and the meditation of all our hearts be now and always acceptable in your sight, O God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Well, it's a pleasure to be back with you again today. I was ordained a priest in this church 22 years ago next month, right here at these steps. So I always have a feeling of coming home when I'm here. What takes away from the sweetness of my return this time is that it is just four of us up here in the chancel today. That's all we're allowed. It would have been wonderful to be with you on Palm Sunday with a church full of people as it usually is, celebrating this great day together in person. But in the midst of this pandemic, this live stream is the safest way for us to gather. And you will see that even the four of us up here at the front are trying our best to practice physical distancing today. So thank you for tuning in wherever you may be. Thank you to Canon Peter Walker, to Chris Leonard and the church wardens of the parish for making this possible. Thanks to Tom Fitches, our organist, and I would echo Peter's welcome back to Maria Ling as she returns from 14 days of self-isolation. Thank you to all of you, and thank you to Christian leaders across our diocese and throughout the world who are trying in the best ways possible to create Christian community under very difficult circumstances this year. Today, we stand on the precipice of Holy Week, and what a week it will be, probably like no other in our memory. As we enter into the holiest of weeks this year, we do so continuing to be separated from each other physically, but we are united with followers of Jesus near and far, past, present, and future, as we celebrate once again the events that lie at the very heart of our faith. Remember, please remember, in this anxious and uncertain time, that you are not alone. The God of Abraham and Sarah, who came to them in their barrenness, the God of Moses and his exiled people, the God who came to Jesus in the bleakness of the wilderness, this God, our God, is with us, even in the midst of our own exile. Today is Palm Sunday, the first day of Holy Week, and I invite you this morning to pivot away from the headlines, to pivot away from the statistics and projections about the coronavirus here in our own city and around the world. Pivot away from the anxiety of your newsfeed and center yourselves on this week, which for Christians brings hope and meaning to our lives, and peace in the midst of every storm, including this one. Our service today began with Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. That's what we normally would have reenacted today, waving palm branches in our hands, processing through the building and perhaps outside, and singing all glory, laud, and honor to thee, Redeemer King. And then, in this amazing liturgy, we move quickly from the glory of the palms to the dramatic reading of the Passion, this year from Matthew's Gospel, remembering that the same crowds that welcomed a king would, within just a few days, be shouting for his death. As the movement unfolds over the next seven days, we meet various people along the way. We've already heard from some of them today. Over the next few minutes, I invite you to reflect on those players and what it might have been like for them. This homily is a kind of guided meditation in which I will invite you to consider how we might enter more deeply into Holy Week through the eyes and ears of those who were there when they crucified our Lord, as the great hymn says. The central figure in this story is, of course, Jesus. 
I invite you to think about this. What would it have been like for him to stand there, jeered by those who only days before had cheered him? As Jesus is accused by the high priests and interrogated by Pontius Pilate and mocked by the crowd, perhaps it calls to mind people in our own world who are unjustly treated. Maybe we know people who have been falsely accused. Perhaps you know what it is like to feel abandoned and betrayed, even by those who have called you friend. And what could it have possibly been like for Jesus as he was nailed to that cross on that first Good Friday? He cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When have we felt the utter absence of God? Are we feeling that now, in our own time, in our own place? Or maybe as you journey through this Holy Week, you will identify with someone like Peter. We will hear from him on Good Friday as well. Peter was so confident that he was going to stand with Jesus to the bitter end. Even if I must die with you, he promised, I will not deny you. But when things started to get difficult, that's what Peter did. When have we gone back on our word? When have we not kept our promises? When have we been too afraid to speak up? Here in Matthew's Gospel, we also meet an unnamed girl, a servant. And when Peter tried to slink away into the darkness, she exposed him as a follower of Jesus. He also is one of them, she said. She wouldn't allow Peter to hide in the shadows. What about us? Do we have the boldness to challenge others to be authentic, to hold each other to account for the promises that we have made? This week, we will also hear the voice of Pontius Pilate. Pilate was the Roman governor of Judea, a powerful man who had authority to sentence people even to death. But he had no idea how to deal with Jesus in this moment. He found no fault in him, but he also had no desire to stir up the crowd. In the end, Pilate took the easy way out. He released a convicted murderer, Barabbas, and then handed Jesus, the one who is called the Messiah, over to the crowd. Are there times when we act against our better judgment in order to please others? When have we simply gone along in order to get along? In Matthew's Gospel alone, we also hear the voice of Pilate's wife. As her husband sits on the judgment seat, ready to decide Jesus' fate. She sends word to her husband, have nothing to do with this innocent man, for today I have suffered a great deal because of a dream about him. When are we guided by dreams and intuitions? Throughout the pages of scripture, God spoke truth to his people through dreams and visions. How does God speak to us in these ways, especially in these difficult days? There was also a man named Simon from the city of Cyrene in North Africa. Simon was walking along the road as Jesus carried his cross. As Jesus struggled under the weight of those beams, Jesus, Simon took the load from Jesus' shoulders and carried the cross for him. When have others carried a load or a burden for us? What are the moments in our own lives when we cannot seem to take another step, but God provides someone who can do it for us? We also know that two criminals were crucified with Jesus, one on his right and one on his left. 
Matthew doesn't say much more about them than that in his gospel, but if we had read Luke's gospel today, we would have heard that the first criminal mocked Jesus and lashed out at his inability or perhaps his unwillingness to deliver on his promise to make the world right. Are there times when we blame God for what has happened in our lives? Do we get frustrated that God does not seem to answer us in our times of greatest need? But what about that second criminal? He was so unlike the first. He was also staring death in the face, yet he was able to see Jesus for who he truly was. When do you suppose he found his faith? Was it when he heard Jesus praying, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing? Perhaps in that moment, this criminal saw in Jesus a deeper love than he had ever known, the embodiment of a new realm of love and truth. So he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. What about us? When has God's grace come upon us in times of despair? Can we find faith even in the midst of losing everything else? In these dark and anxious and uncertain days, can we see God's hand at work in our lives? Finally, in this wonderful unfolding story, we encounter a centurion. After Jesus' death on the cross, we might expect a Roman soldier to be the last person to recognize who Jesus was. But instead, he was the first. Truly, this man was God's son, he said. As Jesus breathed his last, this centurion somehow knew that Jesus was no ordinary man. What are the moments of revelation for us? When is our faith inspired? When have we found truth in unexpected places? All of these individuals give voice to the passion this week. But there is another voice, the voice of the crowd. That angry mob cried out for Jesus' death. How terrible of them, but also how easy for them. When you're the part of a crowd, you can be anonymous. Nobody quite knows where the loudest cries are coming from. When do we find ourselves in that crowd? When are we swayed by the group? When do we disappear into the masses rather than standing alone with the courage of our convictions? This week, this holy week, we are invited to stand alongside all these people. When we see through their eyes, when we hear with their ears, when we try to feel with their hearts, we can enter more fully into this amazing story. Making this Holy Week journey will be different and more difficult this year. Most of us will do so from home, watching a screen, seeking to enter fully into an experience which cannot be entered into in the usual ways. I invite you today to do your best. Try to pattern your week in a way that allows you to walk on the road to journey with a Savior. Join us in whatever ways you can, at the Last Supper on Thursday evening, at the cross on Good Friday, and then at the glorious empty tomb on Saturday evening and Sunday morning. The path begins today with the one who rides on a donkey. That same path ends with God's perfect gift of light and life 
for us and for the whole world. So be with us. Be with God's church this week as we lean into the story that stands at the very heart of our faith. Amen. Thank you, Bishop Kevin, for your words to us. And you mentioned Monday, Thursday, Good Friday. We're going to have live stream services on those days. So please consider a time to tune in and worship with us here at Grace Church. It is a rich week and we must enter it, fully participate with it in the fullness of faith as best we can. Now we're going to sing a hymn, hymn 197. O dearest Lord, thy sacred head with thorns was pierced for me. Let us pray. Let us pray with confidence to the Lord. O Lord our God, we come to you wanting to praise you and adore you, but our hearts are troubled and anxious. We ask your Spirit to guide us as we pray. Lord Jesus, help us in our isolation and separation from one another to know that you are with us and you bind us together with your love. We are not alone because your spirit indwells us and your promises are true. You will be with us always for you will never fail us nor forsake us. 
On this Palm Sunday, we celebrate your triumphal entry into Jerusalem. As the people wave palm leaves and shouted Hosanna, aid us in our worship of you, especially when times get hard and we feel distressed. Oh, that we might also cry out, Hosanna to the King of David, to the Son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. For the governments of the nations working hard to stem the spread of the COVID-19 virus, we pray you help them. For the governments of many countries releasing aid and support for their people suffering and struggling, we ask for your divine providence. We pray for the church and with her leaders, priests and laity who look to you for wisdom and strength as we observe Holy Week in dispersion and isolation and as we continue to do acts of justice and mercy for the least of our brothers and sisters. We are not afraid because you are our fortress, our rock and our deliverer. We bring before you all those charged with the care and treatment of all victims of COVID-19 and those suffering from other ailments and illnesses. The numbers are overwhelming, so we ask that you uphold them in their fatigue and banish their despair. Give comfort and renew their energy and compassion and send them balm for their weary bodies and spirits. Protect them and their loved ones as they are all at risk of getting infected. We pray for all those in need, those who have lost their means of income, those who are in desperate situations like refugee camps, those who are stuck at home with an abusive person, those whose mental health is in a precarious state, those who are not coping well emotionally, as well as those in our parish who need your healing touch. We pray for Bob, Tony, Jennifer, Rosie, Elizabeth, Dolph, Gail, Logan, Catherine, Jill, Lily, Melissa, Graham, Janice, Anne, Chris, Lorraine, Yorick, Jan, Joe, and Hans. Remembering also those known only to us at this time. We cry, Hosanna. We say, save them, Lord. We pray for those who died recently, Bill Langford, Mary Fouquier, and Jackie Lamont. Rest eternal, grant to them, O Lord, and let light perpetual shine upon them. Comfort their bereaved families. We pray for all children and young people in whose lifetimes the world has become so different from what those of us who are older know it to be. We pray for ourselves as well, because we cannot recognize the world as it is today. So we take comfort in the knowledge that you, Lord, hold all of us in the palm of your hand. Give us grace to trust you more. O oh Lord, we are at the limits of our power to help. For what we have left undone, forgive us. For what you have helped us to do, we thank you. For what must be done by others, lend your strength. Now shelter us in the peace which passes our understanding. And we pray this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. At this point, let us share signs and symbols of the peace of Christ virtually. The peace of Christ be with you. Peace to you from all of us here at Grace this morning. And I want to say thank you for your continued and sustained generosity to this church. The people of Grace, the community of Grace are responding wonderfully. I know it's so difficult for all of us, but there's lots of ministry to do, and we're trying to do it under difficult conditions. Particularly, we need to fund the Churches on the Hill food bank at this time of great strain on their resources. So we are committed to doing that as best we can. So thank you to our community for your generous support. We're going to sing the wonderful hymn by Samuel Crossman, the wonderful hymn, My Song is Love Unknown, My Savior's Love to Me, hymn 184.
Once again, I thank our bishop for his courage under fire for being with us this morning, Palm Sunday Festival. It's been a great blessing, and I'm going to ask him to close our liturgy with prayers and a blessing. Let us pray. Almighty God, we give you thanks, for you are good, and your mercies endure forever. Here we stand at the beginning of this holy week, in which your church remembers the passion and death of your Son. O oh God, we are distracted by many things this week. Turn our eyes to the one who comes in your name, the one who opens the gates of righteousness, the one who lays down his life for the sheep. We bless you, O oh God, for shining your light upon us this day. We bless you for sending us your Son in human frailty to walk the road we walk. Open our eyes this week that we may perceive his saving work. May we who now walk with him in the way of his suffering also share with him in the joy of his resurrection. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. And now may the Father, who so loved the world that he gave his only Son, bring you by faith to his eternal life. May Christ, who accepted the cup of sacrifice in obedience to the Father's will, keep you steadfast as you walk with him the way of his cross. May the Spirit, who strengthens us to suffer with Christ, that we may share his glory, set your minds on life and peace. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you this day, this holy week, and remain with you forevermore. Amen.